approximately five minutes. the Lord everybody hallelujah it is good to be in the house of the Lord this evening good to see everybody smiling faces here tonight we are looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us uh, we uh, don't have any real announcements to make here this evening uh, so uh, just uh, remind you 
this weekend, regular services, Sunday morning at 10 a.m. and Sunday night, 6 p.m. And uh, so we're just going to continue on. Hallelujah. Um, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Invite him into this service here tonight. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for this opportunity once again to be in your presence. We invite you, Lord, to have your way in this tabernacle. Lord, that you would be high and exalted, that your train would fill this temple. And God, that you would receive all glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord here tonight. Jesus, lover of my soul. Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me.
good to be in the house of the Lord. You may be seated here this evening. Hallelujah. We do have some prayer requests that we want to make sure that we 
bring to your attention. We are continuing to pray for little Jimmy. Also, let's remember uh, Sister Shirley and the Cup family. Uh, if you have an unspoken request, you signify by raising your hand. Hallelujah. Let's go to the Lord and ask him to touch all of our needs here tonight. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you, Lord God, that you are our healer, our deliverer, our tower, oh God, our rock of defense. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we can come to you in time of need, knowing, Lord God, that you are more than able, you're willing to touch the very feeling of our infirmities. And Lord, we ask you right now, Lord, tonight, that you would touch every need in this place, both spoken and unspoken. God, you know the situation. God, you know every heart. You know every mind. Lord, you know every need. And Lord, we're asking you right now, knowing, Lord God, that you are the God who answers prayer, and we will not fail to give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise the Lord. Woo. name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Tonight we are going to complete our series on the nine secrets of healthy relationships. The nine secrets of healthy relationships. And if you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 22 here this evening. The nine secret relationships and in tonight we will be talking about the subject of self-control. You go to Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 22 in the New Living Translation. The Bible says in Galatians 5, 22 and 23 in the New Living Translation. But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, He will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Here, there is no conflict with the law. And Lord, I'm asking you tonight, touch us, O Lord, as we endeavor to study your word. Help us, God, to understand the truth contained within your scripture. Lord, that you and you alone would receive all glory. Amen. God bless you. you. may be seated here tonight. We are, as I said, concluding our series here tonight on the nine secrets of healthy relationship. And we are talking about the subject of self-control. Now, I don't think it's any accident that the fruit of the Spirit, as mentioned in your re hearing tonight, begins with love and it ends with self-control. Because all of the fruits of the Spirit eventually tie to self-control. Billy Graham once stated, There are men who can command armies, but cannot command themselves. There are men who by their burning words can sway vast multitudes, but who cannot keep silence under provocation or wrong. The highest mark of nobility is self-control. It is more kingly than a regal crown and a purple robe. This is an area that in our nation today, and dare I say even in our world, that is severely lacking. We, do, we are a people who does not have self-control. Many people, Christian and non-Christian alike, fail in areas of self-control. We can have self-control in some areas, and then we lack self-control in other areas. But the Holy Ghost can help us with those areas in which we are lacking. Can I get an amen? 
He can help us learn to voluntarily abstain from things that we need to abstain from. He can help us to achieve things we need to achieve. <clears throat> the Greek word that is translated self-control or temperance in the Scripture is a combination of two specific words. En kratos. En kratos, the word en means in, and kratos means strength, power, might, dominion. So what we're talking about when we're talking about in kratos is we're talking about being in strength, being in power, being in self-control. It is from this word kratos that we get our English words like democratic, which means to be ruled by the people. We also get our word theocratic, which means to be ruled by God. Or autocratic, which means to be ruled by self. Thus, the person who is en kratos is a person who is ruled from within. And not ruled by our own power, but ruled by God's power. Can I get an amen? amen. There is two natures at war within each of us. And one of those natures is a sin nature. And we can only become who we need to be in Christ when we allow God's Spirit to live within us and control that sin nature. Galatians 5 and 16 says it this way, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen? Amen. In our world today, most people believe it is easier to yield yourself to those urges than to bring yourself under self-control. But when you look at the consequences of yielding yourself to your baser instincts, the concept becomes quite foolish and quite obvious that those choices are painful and lead self-destruction. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 28 in the New Living Translation says, a person without self-control is as a defenseless as a city with broken down walls. Anything that is left uncontrolled in your life can harm you and your relationships. Can I have an amen? For instance, Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says, And don't sin by letting anger gain control over you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a mighty foothold to the devil. So uncontrolled anger can destroy you and destroy your relationship. Yes. Yes. Proverbs chapter 6 and 26 in the CEV version says, A woman who sells her love for as little as the price of a meal, but making love to another man's wife will cost you everything. Therefore, uncontrolled lust can destroy you and your relationships. Proverbs 21 and 20 in the New Living Translation says, The wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. Uncontrolled spending can destroy you and your relationships. Come on now. Praise God. Proverbs chapter 23, 29 through 30 in the CEV says, Who is always in trouble? Who argues and fights? Who has cuts and bruises? Whose eyes are red? Everyone who stays up late having just one more drink. Right. Uncontrolled drinking will destroy you and your relationships. Praise God. 1 Timothy 6 and 9 says, People who want to be rich 
fall into all sorts of temptations and traps. But they are caught by foolish and harmful desires that drag them down and destroy them. Your uncontrolled ambition will destroy you and your relationships. And then finally, James chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 in the New Living Translation says this, So also, is, so also the tongue is a small thing, but what enormous damage it can do. A tiny spark can set off a great forest fire, and the tongue is a flame of fire. It is full of wickedness that can ruin your whole life. It can turn the entire course of your life into a blazing flame of destruction. For it is set on fire by hell itself. Your uncontrolled tongue can get you into trouble. It can destroy you and your relationships. Amen? I think you get the point. We need self-control. There is a ever-expanding growth of scientific evidence and medical studies that confirm the fact that those people who attend church faithfully are consistent in their physical and mental well-being. And although he's not a Christian, Harvard professor Herbert Benson admits that humans, and I quote, are engineered for religious faith, wired for God. Our genetic blueprint has made believing in an infinite, absolute part of our nature. For instance, a study of the factors that contribute to healthy families found that 84% of strong families identified religion as an important contributor to their strength. Amen? Alcohol abuse is highest among those who have no religious commitment. And one particular study found that almost 89% of all alcoholics lost interest in religion during their youth. Many studies have found an inverse correlation between religious commitment and drug abuse. In other words, the lower your religious commitment, the higher your chances for drug abuse. Among young people, the importance of religion is the single best predictor of substance abuse patterns. Joseph Califano, head of the Columbia University Center for Addiction and Substance Abuse, said, Every individual I have met who successfully came off drugs or alcohol has given religion as the key to their re rehabilitation. Multiple studies have found that the higher the level of religious commitment, there is a direct correlation to the lower levels of depression and stress. One Gallup poll found in respondents that the strong religious commitment made them twice as likely to describe themselves as very happy. Armand Nicoli, professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, says Christians are far less likely to experience mental disorders than their secular counterparts. Why is this? Why do you think this is? Well, I believe it's because one of the essential features of mental anxiety, depression, and so forth is a strong feeling of hope. you a, a prime illustration of this. I got to thinking of this as I was preparing for this lesson here this evening. And I have two examples that I want to throw your way. I've been calling this year 2020 2.0. It's been a rough year. I lost my father January 19th of this year. And I have told my family countless times 
I am tired of being on an emotional roller coaster. I feel like a woman who cannot control her emotions. I'm sorry, ladies. That's just, just the way I feel. I really want to get back to being a man and not feeling anything again. Okay? And it's weird. The things that will set me off. Now, the thing that is really amazing about this is that despite the fact that I'm on this emotional roller coaster, I can feel the presence of God. Yeah. When, when, when I'm yeah. really suffering, yes. okay, I can feel the presence of God come to me Woo. and bring me strength. Amen. Okay? Praise God. Second point. This year, again, is 2022.0. I am constantly reminded in our political life, in our economic life, in our sociological life, in this nation. I don't know if you realize it or not, but America has went from its peak of ascendancy and we've taken an extreme dive. We are no longer the preeminent power in the world. And it has happened in about the last 10 years, and it has dramatically accelerated in the last 10 months. We have turned our back on God, and God has turned His face from us. And I got to praying the other day. And I was talking to God about the societal problems that we have in this nation. How divided we are as a nation. How I really, honestly, in my heart of hearts, believe that within the next 25 years, we will witness the entire collapse and dissolution of the United States of America. We will cease to be a nation in the next 25 years. I believe that in my heart of hearts. Unless we do something to turn this around. And I sat there and I was talking to God about this and I said, Lord, I really, I really, really have no hope that this nation will come out of this. And I told my wife, I said, I don't want any more grandchildren. Because I don't want them being raised in this nation the way it is. My family name can stop. I, 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 cannot, I cannot allow someone to... I, it, not in all good conscience could I do that. And I told God, I said, I, I just feel like I have no hope. And the Lord spoke to me and He said... Aren't you glad your hope is not in this nation? And I stopped and I realized, yeah, yeah, I am. I'm glad my hope is not in this nation. Because right now, if my hope was in this nation, it would be a miserable, miserable sod. But my hope is in Jesus. And therefore, I know, rise or fall, this country collapses it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things because God is coming back and He's going to take His children home. Amen. And that's what I'm referring to. As Christians, even in the worst of times, we have a hope that this nation, that this world, that this populace that does not know Him cannot understand. Amen? Amen? People who don't attend church faithfully are four times more likely to commit suicide than those who attend faithfully. Lack of church attendance correlates more strongly with suicide rates than any other risk factor. Heart surgery patients that have strong religious beliefs are more likely to survive heart surgery. 
Elderly men and women who attend worship service faithfully are less depressed and physically healthier than their peers who have no religious background. One particular study found that church attendance predicted marital satisfaction better than any other variable. The National Marriage Project under Rutgers University found that living together before marriage increases the risk of breaking up after marriage. It also reported that cohabitating women are twice as likely as married women to be physically abused and are three times as likely to be depressed. So, what does this mean? Well, self-control is not just a good idea. Self-control is a God idea. Yes. Amen? Amen. That's good. Now, self-control is not a self-improvement or self-help help program. Those are just fads, okay? And... As Brother Cuomo preached years ago, a fad is worse than a sin. Self-control is not merely an attempt to make a better Christian. But rather, self-control is our expression of appreciation to God for what He's done for us. And He expects it of every, cre of every Christian. 2 Peter 1, 3-4 in the CEV says, We have everything we need to live a life that pleases God. It was all given to us by God's own power. When we learned that we, He had invited us to share in His wonderful goodness, God made great and marvelous promises so that His nature would become part of us. Then we could escape our evil desires and corrupt influences of this world. Now, I'm going to talk about two principles from God's Word that will help you to understand this practice of self-control. The first principle is pretty simple. We live in a world today where it's all about feelings. Everybody's running around like the old Ener Energizer, Ev uh, uh, Energizer commercial from the 70s. They got the battery on their shoulder just daring you to knock it off. Everybody's feelings are on their sleeves. You know, you got to call them by their own personal pronouns, whatever that happens to be at that particular moment. Otherwise, they go all nuts and lose their ever-loving minds. Emotions are something that certainly can add spice to life. But when you become dependent upon your feelings to determine the kind of day you're going to have, you've got a problem. To become more self-controlled means we have to rule our feelings and rule our feelings well. Folks, let me tell you something. I've already told you that this year I've been on an emotional roller coaster. If every time I went into a, 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 an emotional low, I went to my boss and said, I just don't feel like working today. I've got to go home. I won't have a job. Sometimes you just got to press through it. Now, I'm not saying that if you're having a rough time that you can't take time off. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you've got to learn to control some things once in a while. I've been sitting at my desk, and on my desk I have several pictures of my family and, and little knickknacks and things on my desk. And there are two pictures on my desk that every once in a while will catch my eye, and I happen to be in one of those moods at that moment, and it will bring a tear to my eye. In the office, one is uh, a, a picture of Conan, 
and the other is a picture of my dad. Now, if every time my eye saw one of those pictures, I said, oh, do, do, do. I wouldn't be getting nothing done. My boss would come over to me and say, you need to take them pictures down, buddy. <laughs> Instead, I get control of my emotions, I suck it up, and I press on. Society constants us with this idea that we have to give in to our feelings. This whole nonsense that's going on in our world today with this pandemic is feelings over facts. Guess what, folks? Your facts or your feelings don't affect my facts. Give you some facts that I found. This is straight from the Kansas Department of Health website. Since the pandemic hit, we have had no cases of influenza in the state of Kansas. Isn't that interesting? Number two, if you are under the age of 18, right, your chances of catching the Wuhan flu is less than 2%. If you're under 18, your odds of catching it is less than 2%. Your odds of ending up in the hospital if you're under 18 is less than almost 0%. It is so negligible, it can't even be calculated. That's to be hospitalized, folks. 67% of all deaths from the Wuhan flu in the state of Kansas have occurred in people over the age of 74. Do you know what the average lifespan of a Kansan is? 74. So 67% of all deaths have occurred in people who have already exceeded the natural lifespan. Now tell me something. Why are we getting our panties in a twist over this thing? Just a question. I know this is going to get me banned from Facebook and YouTube because it doesn't follow the narrative. But it's facts, folks. And your feelings don't affect the facts. Okay? That's my point. Give you an idea why feelings are not that important. You ever heard somebody say, I fell in love with him. And then six months later, I don't love him anymore. You fall in and out of love so quick, most people don't even have a chance to change their underwear. You fall in and out of love depending on what time of the day it is. People decide to goof off at work because they just can't get into the mood. You ever, I've had this happen. You ever had this happen? I call it spring fever. It usually happens to me in the springtime. I'll usually, sometime about mid-spring or early spring, I'll look at my coworker and say, I'm just not motivated to work right now. You ever had that? It happens, doesn't it? Yes. That's your feelings. You know what you have to do? You just work on through it. Sometimes we have improper feelings. Feelings that we wouldn't express to anybody in public or in good company. We have to be careful that we do not give in to those feelings because your temptation feeds on your feelings. And the only way you will win the battle against temptation 
is by overcoming your feelings. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 says this in the NIV. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Again, self-control is not a self-help concept. You need the Spirit of God because God's Spirit will help you say, No, I'm not doing that. I don't care how I feel. I'm not doing it. I am going to control myself. The fruit of the Spirit is much like the fruit of a tree. The fruit of the tree is buried deep within the tree until it starts coming out. The fruit of the Spirit is buried deep within you until you allow God's Spirit to draw it out of you. It's kind of like this concept. You ever seen the waiters walk around? They got the, the tray on there. I could never do this. My tremors would kick in and somebody gets soup in their lap. Okay? But waiters, they can carry that tray like this, boy. And, and if you've ever watched the, the, the uh, musical Hello, Dolly, they, they do this whole song and dance where they're spinning those trays around and doing all kinds of fancy moves, carrying this tray full of water and all kinds of stuff. And it's just amazing, you know? But here's the deal. The fruit of the Spirit is just like that. When, that's up, when, when that waiter's carrying that, that bowl or that pitcher up there on that tray, you don't know what's in it. The only way you're going to know is if you go up there and jostle his arm and make it spill out. Okay? You, you go and you bump into the waiter, you're going to know what's in his, in his bowl. It's the same way it is with your spirit. We don't know what's on the inside until somebody bumps into you. Till somebody does you wrong. Till somebody crosses you. Till somebody steps on your feelings. Hurts your feelings. Then we're going to find out what's really on the inside. We need to be careful that what's on the inside and spills out when we get bumped into is the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? Amen. So, feelings can be ignored. Number two is simply this. Ditches can be avoided. Let me tell you a story. You know me, I like to tell stories. I'll tell a story. When I first got my driver's license, young kid on the farm, I'm driving around. I'd, it's my second car by this point. It's a 1976 Cobra. And out there in western Kansas, after a rain, those dirt roads get all covered with ruts and they're muddy and they're nasty and then they dry out and you've got these big ruts. And the road graders would come through to grade the roads back down to smooth them out. But instead of doing one mile sections at a time, they would do like 10 miles at one go. And they would take and do one side and pile the dirt up in the middle. And so you had to drive on the other side of the road, the wrong side of the road, basically. And then they'd come back the other way and smooth it back out and... And so it was a real pain in the neck. And one day, my sister and I are coming back from school, and I'm happening to drive on the left-hand side of the road like I lived in England. And I'm a driver, and my left front tire starts to go down into the ditch. And that car had rack and pinion steering, and I overcorrected, and what ended up happening was the car flew over the pile of dirt in the middle of the road, and landed in the other ditch. I then, again, as an inexperienced driver, panicked again and overcorrected the other direction. It comes flying out of the ditch, spins a 180, and flies all the way into the field on the other side of the road, and it takes a 
Milo stock, a piece of Milo, and drives it through the radiator and bends the fan, and then the fan spins around and shreds the radiator, and it blew the tire clean off the rim. I finally got the car stopped. I get out, and my sister, we're only a half a mile from the house. So my sister gets out of the car and starts walking through the Milo field to the house. I then pull the car up back up on the road and begin changing my tire to get my car home. Well, we had to replace the radiator. When my dad took the radiator out of the car to take it to the radiator shop to get it put back together, the radiator man says, boy, when this kid messes up a radiator, he does a good job. Now, why am I telling you that story? Because ditches can be avoided. Personal freedom, your personal freedom, whether it's as a Christian or as an American, is just like a highway with a ditch on either side. On one side of the ditch, you have legalism. And on the other side of the, the road is licentiousness. The difference being the law versus loose living, okay? Legalism can restrict your freedoms to the point of bondage. But licentiousness can release your freedoms to the point of bondage. Both ditches have to be avoided. Self-control is the center line running down the highway, it's the balance between the two extremes. Self-control says, I say no to everything God forbids. But self-control also says, I say yes to everything God commands. Self-control tells us, I say no to everything that is a hindrance to me. But self-control says this even if that thing is not forbidden by God. In other words, as pastor always says, you got sins and you got weights, right? You got to watch out for the weights. But self-control says, I will say yes to everything that is a blessing, even if God doesn't command me to take it. I got to tell you, folks, if there's a blessing out there and you don't want it, tell God to give it to me. I'll take it. Okay? You don't want the blessing, I'll take it. Galatians 5 and 13. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Sorry, got distracted here. You've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. In 1 Corinthians, Paul gives us some principles that will help us make decisions in those quote-unquote questionable areas of our life. He talks about all things being lawful, but... okay. So in other words, you are free. Can I get an amen? But just because you are free to do something doesn't mean it's right. For instance... 1 Corinthians 6 and 12 says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the, under the power of in, any. In other words, all things are lawful, but will they lead to freedom or will they lead to slavery? You have to make that call. 1 Corinthians 8 and 9 says, But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. So in other words, all things are lawful, but will they make a stumbling block for a brother or sister, or will they be a stepping stone to help them get up higher? Will they be a stumbling block to you, or will they help you get up higher? in your relationship with God. 1 Corinthians 10 and 23. 
All things are lawful to me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. In other words, all things are lawful, but will they build me up or will they tear me down? 1 Corinthians 10 and 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. In other words, all things are lawful to you, but will they please me or will they bring glory to God? 1 Corinthians 10 and 33. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, for they may be saved. In other words, all things are lawful to me, but will they help lead people to Christ or will they drive people away from Christ? You see, the way we live with the freedom that God has given us demonstrates whether we have God on the inside or not. And we've been talking in this series about the fruit of the Spirit. But before Paul gives us the fruit of the Spirit, in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, he gives us the works of the flesh. And he says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, your lives will produce these evil results. Sexual immorality, impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, participation in demonic activities, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, divisions, the feeling that everyone is wrong except those in your own little group, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other kinds of sin. Let me tell you again, as I have told you before, that anyone living this sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen? Stand with me this evening. This concept of living in absolute freedom with no restraints, no self-control, living in the flesh and the will of the flesh is essentially nothing more than the way our society lives to this day. And the only way we will escape sin and its punishment is if we allow God to fill our lives and direct us. If we have the works in the flesh in us, according to His Word, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. We have to have the Holy Ghost working on the inside of us to help bring out the fruit of the Spirit, which ends with self-control. Galatians 5.16 says it this way, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And Aristotle, I close with this, said this, I count him braver who overcomes his desire than him who conquers his enemies. For the hardest victory is over self. Yes. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for this people. And I pray, Lord, today that we would learn the importance of self-control. And God, we would realize that it's nothing that we can do in and of ourselves, but true self-control comes from yielding to your spirit and allowing you, O oh God, to control our lives from within. We cannot do it in ourselves. We are weak. We are frail. We are sinful. But God, through your Spirit, you can give us the power, the willpower, the strength to overcome, to be victorious, to be self-controlled. And I thank you for it. 
in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord here for a moment tonight. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Oh, lead me. to this world. And Lord, bring us back at the appointed hour, we pray. 